no lo están viendo a través de nuestras... Good afternoon, everyone. To all the people who are watching us through our social media. In behalf of the group on intercultural processes in architecture, urbanism, and territory, we welcome you to this seminar entitled Decolonizing the Urban Territories, Processes of State Colonization and Indigenous Resistance to be held this 22, 23, and 24 November. In this seminar, we are talking about several processes of dispossession, both in English and Spanish. With this go, we, we shared several questions, inviting people to open the reflection questions such as how is urban expansion advancing over territorial lands of indigenous communities? How are irregular urbanization processes occurring in rural areas inhabited by indigenous people? How are ethnic real estate projects created and promoted? What different forms does indigenous resistance take in these urban territories? what different actions are being carried out, what imaginaries are being reactivated, and what every forms are emerging. According to these diverse questions, we received several praise papers from different parts of the world through unique and repeatable processes. Together, they show us the wide and deep range of considerations, both historical and daily as well as the various forms in which these processes of urban colonization are expressed in different parts of the world. He also showed us a wide range of forms of reorganization and resistance. This panorama ratified the validity and relevance of this territorial issue in very different scenarios, as well as the, as well as the urgent need to rethink and promote new spaces for dialogue beyond the academic format. In that way, we can exchange idea, create critical reflection and proposal. During these three days, we will appreciate activities that seek to promote dialogue and open up the understanding of urban issues in relation to indigenous peoples. In addition to the roundtables of papers during the mornings, we will have also tables of conversation during the afternoons, such as the one we're about to have with the issues that the seminar asks about. So please engage with us, ask questions through our social media and participate with us. To start with this afternoon's table, here we're going to talk about the implementation of indigenous public policy in Chile. This is looking for paying attention to the dialogue oriented to indigenous peoples in urban areas. From the academic works here, we have said that now we have a paradigm that goes deeper in these ways of expressing rights for peoples that have been historically invisibilized. But this also represents ways of perpetuating these threats to these peoples that are different. This paradox, different perspective on our guests Today, are going to talk about this. We're going to first listen to Ricardo Arancibia. He's the person in charge of the Department of Indigenous Peoples in Recoleta. We also have Manceraya. And we had another guest from Teñete that couldn't join us today. Please be welcome for the people who are watching us. We're going to talk in this hour and a half 
three questions. They are going to show us the work of the people that are here with us today regarding public policy in indigenous, on indigenous peoples and how they think about this relation between the legal framework and the elements that are or should be considered. So we'll give space for each of them to answer this question. And we will also have a moment for so people join us can also participate. Yeah, I would like to introduce Ricardo Arancivia, who's here, person in charge of this Department of Indigenous Peoples in Recoleta. Are you here, Ricardo? Yes. And Nancy is here as well. So we will begin first. Please introduce yourselves and describe the indigenous public policies because people are not very aware of it. So we would like to know what do you do in your exercise? Okay. Hello, everyone. I thank the, the invitation. I said hi in different languages, as I was saying, I thank the invitation. I'm part of the program of indigenous peoples in Recoleta. And to show you what we do, I have a presentation that I want to share with you. So you can see what we do there. Can you see? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, in order to be very precise, this program of Indigenous people started in 2013 with Daniel Hadwe and Bacoleta. The work intended is to generate spaces of cultural participation through this board of intercultural, the intercultural board, sorry, of indigenous people. And we have participation of different representatives from Aymara, Mapuche, Quetzal, Villaguita, Licanantai, and Setnam people. Inside our, among our goals, we have to safeguard the indigenous rights and the covenant 169 from ILO, specifically in Recoleta, we promote the participation, the public works available, and also promoting the culture and the rights of indigenous peoples. There we have some pictures about the diversity of the peoples that live in Recoleta. We consider ourselves a plurinational municipality, where we aim to generate dialogues. Although the covenant is something different from the national policy, we try to imply all the decisions that regard indigenous people with this board. We have a work model that has different levels of intervention. It includes a social, cultural, economic, and legal aspects, self-management, organization, articulation, measurability, that we want to register and be able to measure what we do. Our key concepts are the intercultural participation and intercultural protocols, and our principles are constitutional recognition, decolonization, among others. Here are some of the organizations that participate in this board. We have organizations with different characteristics, some associations, organizations, hoppers, hope, um, autonomous communities that do not have a legal person. They are if de facto communities. So as you can see, it's a very, uh, diverse board that represent the peoples in Recoleta. 
we have this table with the different lines of work that we have and the interaction with the local institution the local institution and the regional institution we have different lines such as community and culture intercultural education and health sports productive development and lately uh, plurinational symmetry all of these are part of the local and the regional institution here specifically we have the lines of work that i just mentioned and here are our services they are for individuals and for collectives we support the formation of organizations but formal and informally uh, we train people on interculturality, plurinationality, decolonization, and we would like to be a referent, a technical referent on all of these topics. This is our annual calendar of activities. It starts in January and it ends in December. Our key day is June, the solstice where we renovate our energies. So here we are working with all the communities we just mentioned. I think that's all I'm going to say right now because this is part of the presentation. And then we're going to continue talking about the strengths and the weaknesses that we can have. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Nancy, welcome. We would like to hear you. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. So please introduce yourself and your work. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for the invitation. My name is Nancy Araya. I work at Serviu in Arica de Pinacota. Our main function in the department is to give grants. And that's in what you're saying. The work that we do is related with rurality. I have a presentation of some of the projects that we have developed in the different municipalities in Utre. And as a service, we really care about the rural sector. On words, we'll see why the Minister of Housing has a collaboration with Gonali that is for us to work on the demand to give these friends and give a solution regarding housing. As we know, um, nowadays, the rural areas tend to be without population and our idea is to give some kind of incentive to young people to stay there because they usually go to the cities and in rural places uh, older people live so we would like to enchant the youth for them to stay in the places where they come from and we to share some projects that we have developed. And you are muted now. Uh, we can see your screen, but we cannot hear you right now. Can you see the picture? Yes. Great. So here we have two projects that we have developed as minister. One is in Putre, it's Marca. This project was difficult for us to develop with people, with local people. We must consider that our housing policies change every year. And in this project specifically, we had 33 houses that we developed in the 
in this place. And it was hard for us to work with them because um, agreeing on the design uh, cost that was uh, very expensive. Countries were, uh, sorry, years were passing by. And in the end, in 2018, so 33 solutions for people from Putre or close by. So they are part of this place, as you can see here, the design, the windows are small, but uh, there's also technical work that was developed. I'm trying to fit this in the geography of the place. This was a very beautiful project. I feel very proud of being part of this project from the beginning. These people had the grant from long ago and they could concrete this through the Foundation Superación de la Pobreza. They were key in the participation of this process hand by hand with the beneficiaries. They got to develop this project that was approved in 2011 and in this come and go, we gave this solution in 2018. Then we had a different project in the urban sector that is called Hijos de la Tierra, Children of the Earth. This is developed by 80%. It's part of Arica, and the important thing is that it's also fitting in the geography. You can see these are hot buildings that could be something arguable for some people. Um, we could implement some terraces for people to crop. And we also designed a ceremonial square so they could maintain their culture somehow, even though these are high buildings. Today, this project, as you can see, it's 80% ready. We hope to give it to people next year. It's going to be for 100 families. And it's also a very beautiful project that was also difficult to carry out. This is what the Ministry of Housing has been doing in this context, working with families so we can treat this housing need according to what said. Thank you very much, Nancy. The idea is that we go talking a bit about these functions. The description is so that Ricardo gave us. We have two different institutions from the state, municipality and a ministry, but they both aim to come together with the population. In that sense, what's the work you do and what has been the answer of the people? What, what have been your your mistakes let's say and the things you have done right how would you evaluate who would you assess this process or ricardo or nancy i don't know who wants to begin hi nancy um part of the things that we have done right it's just taking the time to dialogue and to take resolutions it requires to open dialogue spaces to listen to opinions, different understandings that are not only tech. In our case, we are working with different people, so it's very important to generate the conditions for that dialogue to be quality marks in equal conditions, quality marks. And to get to that uh, 
same condition, we should provide some base, basic information for everyone. And that's also what have we've been developing and understanding about intercultural protocols. I think that every people has their own protocols. Mapuche people have very strict things about them. I would say hi, we listen to the other. When we go visit someone, we cannot go with empty hands. And of course, Aymara, Quechua, they have their own. Every people have their own protocols and we must learn them to generate a dialogue. We cannot just establish the topics. There is always some questions about the family, the territories, etc. In fact, here we have a community that lives in Santiago, but it also in Putre, now that they are talking about the North. And they were there and they also work here. So there's this sort of border territory that we have to learn how to understand these processes that can be rural, but they are also uh, rural. So they are urban and rural at the same time. So for us, the right thing is to generate a dialogue. That's something key. And that dialogue has to be with this intercultural protocols where we can establish minimum conditions uh, we trust each other. We have to understand that we as states, either at a central or local level, we represent a state that has been, famous. it's recognized this um, historical debt that has the state. So in some way we have to decolonize those expressions to be able to dialogue in any situation. Those has been the things that we have done right. And in that same sense, we have tried to generate managed projects. All the things we do is joint efforts. So we always work collabor in collaboration and communities have to be a contribution that's one of the principles for Mapuche and for the people from the Andes. And those principles are part of our practices. And in that way, we're doing this intercultural participation. That's a concept that we have integrated to understand that all the communities have different conditions to exercise their rights. And in, it's in this joint work that we can develop projects that have the belonging sense. I think that's one of the main things that we have done right. And management of resources is in both hands, not only in the institution, but also in the communities. So that has allowed us to have a very strong work with communities from different indigenous peoples. So I would say that's something um, that we can highlight here in Recoleta. In different projects that I'm going to tell you about later, we have a very interesting project that comes from this specific collaboration that is a cemetery for indigenous people, that it's not like just anything, it's a historical rehabilitation. Um, Further on, I'm going to, to give you more details about it. And now I'll give the floor to Nancy, and then we can talk about the but let's say. Yes, no problem. Let's do it. I'm going to speak from the point of view of the work that we do as the ministry. Sadly, in this region, we don't have an office in the rural area. The work that we do with the communities, we do it through the municipalities. For us, they are an important tool for the work that we do. They know 
the area, the people. And since a long time, we have been working with the majors so we can create entities that are sponsors. Ricardo maybe knows better how we work with the grants. These sponsor entities are private companies and they have to develop a plan project so they can apply for the grant and develop these building projects. These sponsor entities have all the willingness to go through this process because they have to apply in the ministry, but the problems are in the technical aspects. We have been facing a lot of challenges to reach these professionals to in order to develop these projects, either housing projects or to improve or enhancing this housing. So with this program of overcoming poverty, this project was very important. The, the organization that participated here because they achieved and they were able to develop a project. The municipality gave the support, but they were the ones that were leading the path and they were able to conclude this project. So what I believe is that the municipalities should have a more active participation in these processes and to be able to work hand in hand from the ministry or the departments with the municipalities. I have had meetings with majors so we could work together to so we can present projects to work together. It is important what they said, what Ricardo said about the articulation. That's the, the invitation that we do to municipalities to work hand in hand so we can um, take advantage of these collaborations. I just wanted to remind you that since we are with translators, I wanted to ask you to speak in a normal speed. And I include myself because I speak very fast so, so we could speak in a slow pace. So we have this articulation aspect that Nancy said. Ricardo, mm, the other aspect, how, how do you see the challenges or the failures or the learning aspects that you had through this process? Yes, there are many challenges that are pending. And of course, the with the experience, you start learning. And we have an interdependency, not only in the municipality, but also with other entities and institutions. Maybe the, the failures or the mistakes or the challenges that we have had are related to the lack of resources founding resources and also about willingness to participate from other institutions because sometimes there is no political willingness to facilitate these processes that are already complex due to the intercultural aspects that come from the different indigenous peoples or communities. There are people that are willing to help and we can work well, but sometimes that doesn't happen. At a local level, there are unities or entities that are related to education, culture, but when you present them proposals regarding indigenous peoples and their plurality, 
then they are not that wiggling to work and that puts a hold to how we can move forward. So these are situations that we are in between and we have to try to become medi mediators so we can solve this. This is some kind of like internal colonialism. At an institutional level, there are a lot of resistance to the recognition to, of the indigenous people, communities, and different indigenous people. So these are things that invite us to work in the awareness and trying to teach others about these topics. So maybe there I can say and show one example, which was a big failure in Recoleta, our municipality. We had some time ago, some fight with Cerro Blanco, which is a space that is a um, traditional religious indigenous place where they did ceremonies. So in their autonomy, we didn't interview, but Servio, the housing department, was analyzing and investigating it, and they saw some wrong practices. And they decided to give this area to the municipality because of this. So that was like a hot iron that was really hard to work with because in this area it wasn't just the organization that was in charge there were also other indigenous communities that participated in this area and other folklore folklore groups and cultural groups and that area was given to the municipality, which that decision is not, um, it doesn't come from us. So that it's a big failure that makes everything complex because indigenous people are not happy with this and they claim these places because they are traditional places where they carry out their ceremonies and so because they don't have that many places to to carry out their traditional practices so these kind of places make it easier for other people to come here to these spaces that even if they are not um indigenous people they come to do things and that makes it look back bad for indigenous people and they lose this kind of spaces so there are some areas that are in charge of different departments of ministries and they do whatever with those areas but they should take care and take into consideration these indigenous people. So those that is one aspect that they should improve. Like they should take into consideration what they are used for and if indigenous people are using it. I guess there are more challenges also regarding these projects. Yes how i said at the beginning it's really challenging to develop projects as ricardo said we have to work a lot in the citizen dialogue and regarding the work that the municipality has to carry out their work is really important especially in the areas or territories aspects because they know better what indigenous communities are there. These areas are given generation by generation. And the municipalities 
are the ones that can analyze how are the territories so we can develop housing projects or other kind of projects. So if we want to um, develop projects of any kind, first we have to see the territory because sometimes we have territories in rural areas which are very scarce. They are not that much. So we have to analyze this. I have been working for more than 10 years here in this, and I know that the municipalities should be more active because they are the ones that know better. In Arica and Parinacota region, uh, in Putre, it's very high, so it's very hard to build. So for us to take there the construction materials to this so hard and complex access region is that's a real real challenge. So that's a work that we have to develop with the the involved entities and institution so we can carry out this. Thank you, Nancy. I was muted. <laughs> what catches my attention is what says Ricardo regarding the role of the municipalities. This state, which could be bigger, sometimes has a small shape to reach these communities. So in which way these projects are generated and how they are on in position. Now we are talking about the housing projects. Ricardo was talking about the project in Cerro Blanco. So how can you not differentiate? How can you differentiate this when you have a decision that comes from a higher power or entity? How can you assess this? Like, do they come from the people or where does it come from this creation of projects? Yes, I don't know. <laughs> Miss Nancy, if you want to talk. We, as a department, have developed two projects that, that I present to you in the beginning. And these have been generated from the communities itself. This project in Catamarca what it came from the need of people that live there in the area. And out of luck, we had area that was part of Cedeview department. So that was very good to carry out the project. So the overcoming poverty department was the one that helped us a lot in this because we need people like, or organizations like that, or entities like that, that accompany the families all the time. In this committee of Capacamarca, it was key, the organization that was involved in this project. We gave the grant that gave us another challenge. We also have challenges with the grants because the housing program, it doesn't have a maximum. It depends on the area or territory where it's being carried out. And the grants are created for the locality itself. The, it changes from area to area. 
So it was very expensive, this project, and it was really hard to make the higher entity to approve this project. And it took us two years to be able to found and have foundings for this project. The other project came from another big group and another committee, indigenous committee, which was very huge. It was 200 or so people. And that had to be divided because we couldn't give help to 200 people. So we divided that committee into two different parts of the projects. And for one of the groups, it took us also two years because we couldn't find an area because they wanted houses. Here in Arica, we have a lack of land to be able to build and the demand is really high. So we didn't have any land so we could develop this project. And in 2019, the, cons the building started, the construction, and maybe in 2022, we will be able to have it. So as you mentioned, these projects come from the need of the families from the local people that live there. They are the ones that have that need. In that same line of thought, our work here in the municipality with di different projects that we have developed have always been debated with these indigenous people communities. There is one space where we start presenting the proposals, the demands, the needs. And from there, we try to start dealing and developing everything that allows us to keep moving forward with the projects. In some cases, we have had great achievements and some others not. But the participation comes from the same communities, from the local communities. So that gives us an impulse to start developing these projects. So for example, this project in Cementerios that was plurinational, it was a demand that comes from many decades here in Santiago. I imagine that in other regions happens too, but here in the formal spaces, like the regional government, the, this demand, we had it for like more than 15 years. This demand came from the local leaders that picked up again this demand. And also we had the wiggliness of the major to uh, support this development of the project. This project is moving forward. So that has been a process that has been a process that it's very different that when you have an imposition from the central power the central entity, that it's a higher entity of the government. Sometimes these instructions that come from higher entities are, don't, do not come from the local level. There are a lot of cases where it's very rigid. It's not flexible at all. 
I remember the case of an Aymara brother that he was a teacher and in this program, even though he was Aymara, he had to do classes in Mapuzungun, which, which is the language from the Mapuche people that didn't have anything to do with him. Those kind of situations do not have like a good intention. Like in the end, people accept this and do this because they have other needs. So how Mauro said, without the municipalities, the government wouldn't be able to enforce these public policies. So they need municipalities. It's different from other cases. So if the municipality is engaged with the, with the issues, the projects will be able to achieve and to solve the needs. But if not, if the municipality is not in this one move forward and they will, the projects will be stuck. So that's how we create these project decisions are taken at a local level with some type of like multiculturality in a balance so we can implement them. But the same happens at the health level, health system level and educational level, not just housing level. Let's close this part of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So other people here and also through social media can ask questions. I'm going to take this last element of the multicultural ethos. Authors in the last decade, most of them, especially authors from indigenous peoples, they speak about this multicultural logic that in the end, everything is taken as the same as the indigenous. So this has been a result from the effort of different struggles from different people in this framework. What we see today is that even though there is a framework of recognizing, there are no policies related. An example is that Ricardo Sayen is in charge of a program of indigenous people or a, a framework convention or agreement. It's not a public policy that is permanent. If we think about that context, what can we do related to indigenous and the what are the elements that we should think considering a a better planning? How do you see this in our future with all these restraints? Uh, whoever wants to talk, please. The floor is yours. I don't know, Nancy. Okay. How do you see it in the future? It's simple. <laughs> I think, Mauro, that we have to do is to bring this housing policy to the situation of the peoples, because nowadays we have a policy that it's very plain, let's say. For example, in a rural area, we have a decree that 
regulates everything that is related with the rural areas. But we still have some conditions, such as the person uh, that is applying, they cannot have another housing. And same, uh, most of the people who live in Putre, Camarones, Cunyacawa, Cerro Blanco, different parts in the region, they have houses in the region, but they have a house in Arica. So when I was talking about the migration from the rural to the urban area, they already have a house, so they cannot apply to this brand or urban housing solution. So that's one of the difficulties in the sector. In the ministry now, we have a system called Imbu Connecta. And people register, so we have a count of the committees here in Arica since Connecta was found. We only have three rural committees of more than a hundred that are not rural. So we compare a little the situation between the committees in reality that want to come here, that have a constant demand, and we cannot give them a hand because there are no lands in the place where they We have some lands available in a place that is near to Arica, but it's hard to build in these places because people don't want to live in these places. And if I go to Paso Conecta, there are some committees that are now more than 80 people. And from 2015, we have them registered and we still cannot find a solution for them. So when you ask, uh, improve, we must begin from housing policies for these people, where people from the rural areas, this town is start to have less population because youth go away. And what we need is public policy, not only related to housing, but also work. Um, to a certain level that they have to go to the city to be able to keep studying and they like the city and they want to remain in the city and the rural areas only have people when they have celebrations, local celebrations. And in those contexts, we also find that houses are not in this so this is also related with what I was saying, people who have already a house, they cannot apply for grants to improve their houses. So there's a big demand houses and to build new houses in the lands available. And the other thing is an, a different work that we must do with national institutions to get better at this. Thank you very much, Nancy. Okay. From my side, I would say that what Nancy states is very relevant, considering the youth migration from the rural area to the city, especially because of economic conditions. And that's what makes us remember of our economical development model that is very particular, that makes this situation happen. And we have these migrations that has had also a strong political view on this. Here in Recoleta, for example, we have a lot of migrants and it's good to make the distinction. Most of the migrants population, more than 25% of there is the same as migrant, and most of them belong to an indigenous people, but they are not 
from the ones officially recognized by the national operation of indigenous peoples. So they all have these migratory processes. They come from the south or from the north, and they have had to establish in the center in Recoleta because of economic struggles. This possession also somehow there is a territorial dispossession and then an insertion uh, also generates economic health consequences. So in this concept, in this context, sorry, how can we incorporate state in this function of recognizing the territory? In my opinion, the intercultural policies, more than the multicultural, are quasi multicultural. They don't get there, but they want to get there. Um, they are full of states, they are full of ambiguity, things that the person in charge has to interpret. So we have this. We have now a constitutional. Uh, process post social uprising. This allows us to amplify indigenous voices, indigenous demands that have been there for decades, but nowadays they are stronger, they are more visible. So we have to look at this process and as it will give us um, the answers to specific claims such as housing, health, recognizing, recognition, etc. In that way is how the state is going to articulate with the peoples and their demands. The state intern internally has their contradictions, the central, the regional and the local institutions are different. We in Recoleta have a communist management, and it's of course different from other municipalities with other political views. And this is part of those contradictions. But now, how we move forward with this in a better relation with indigenous people that's aware from universities from different collaborators that are willing to participate in this, we all have to do the effort to generate respectful dialogues and conditions with intercultural protocols. Sometimes these elements are unknown, but these are key when taking decisions. For example, if we think about a house, where to place the door, if it goes to where the sun is. That's something key for Mapuche people and for people from the Andes. They respect the sun and they take it into account. And we have to consider all of these things. And we are in this process of the constitution. We are also choosing a new president for the country. So we are in a key context. Um, depending on the decisions, we can move forward and it will depend on all these sectors that are engaged, whether they are from institutions or not. So interculturality and plurinationality is important. We have to recognize ourselves as a diverse state. And this is part of creating more appropriate policies. And I want to go back to the example of the plurinational symmetry. In our case, we had that need of having a space because of the colonization that, we, that happened in this country. We don't have any symmetry that is considered as indigenous or as intercultural, specifically for peoples. Given that need, what we do is to open up space, of sign, discussion, reflection, and then space of administration, generating an administrative support 
to create this space. Did make us think in constitutional law. Customary law, sorry. So the state will be in hands of the people, the administration of the space. This is a very significant progress, let's say, at Latin American level. I won't give you more information because this is something that we are developing right now, but that's what I want to highlight. We are in this consultation process about the, the state policies and the demands of the indigenous peoples. We don't want a population control. That's something that the state does sometimes. We want to respect us. So this difference makes us the register register of the different protocols that we have. For example, Galvarino municipality, they made Mapudunguna as an official language, the Mapuche language. And that's, I think, my reflection. More than just doing a summary, I think that there's a great diversity and we must emphasize the good experiences to follow that path. That's it for me, Mauro. Great. I would like to give you the floor to all the people who are here with us. If they want to ask any question, I don't know if in our social media we have any question. It seems like we don't have questions. I <laughs> have to all the people here present. I have a question. Thank you very much to the presenter. To, to you, so a question about the work that you have developed. How do you solve the problem of the representativity of these different groups, these different communities that you work with? I understand that in this big diversity that you have mentioned, there is also, well, I imagine that there is also a group or same kind of group where they have different kinds of authorities that are not recognized by institutions. And there are these different authorities that are supported by institutions, public institutions, and I think that there maybe are some conflicts or alliances. So I think that it might be difficult in this context that you have mentioned to work in with institutions in your different jobs. So that's my question. So the floor is yours, Nancy or Ricardo whoever wants to. Let's see. We, to be able to talk, to work with the companies, we work with are the ones that go to the assembly and they represent all the people. And we work with them. The law establishes that to develop a project, committees has to be made with that goal. And um, once I had people and they have organizations that are different, and they take into account different aspects, cultural aspects. But our law says that this has specifically for the idea is to be able to work with them so they represent a group release and they represent a committee okay in our case i think that 
it's a different reality it's a much more open reality we don't have conditions we don't have legal conditions on who to work with and in that sense representativity is very key and it's also something sensitive at legal level some things happen the indigenous law through Konadi somehow qualifies association and communities that are indigenous so by law all these people these families they get together they have a legal person no it's the same as the neighborhoods for example so there is something equal in the law if we consider a lonco a leader from the mapuche people and the president of the neighborhood group they have the same position for this trade but it's not like that as we know so we have this associations communities pops. Uh, at some point we had also a family for housing and they self declare and they self organize the san indigenous people that is recognized by their peers and having that for us is enough for them to participate all the representatives or these institutions have a voice and a vote when we want to decide anything on the municipality and that is also a space of willing so people who wants to go people who is willing to go they are all welcome but those who decide on a more autonomous path they have the right and we cannot link with people who don't want to talk, don't want to dialogue. So from our experience, organizations are the ones who take this. So at some point, many different Mapuche organizations had conflict with another organization and they were disagreeing with the decisions so people decided to leave the group and it's that's a personal decision right nonetheless the people who participate they have this formal represent representation nowadays so clearly there is a situation that we can also see at macro level there is mapuche people who don't belong or don't agree sorry with the constitutional process and they don't feel represented uh, so that's up to the person right what they decide so that's also something important and the criterion that we use is that there's one community that has a representative that participates and engages in this space that is between the institution and the community i don't know if i am answering the question yes thank you very much in katerina mari mari nancy Ricardo. um bueno yo creo que va asociada mi, mi i think that my question is related to why it was this before how do you perceive the impacts of these policies the fragmentation that they produce in the communities how do you measure the impact or the damage in for example dividing a community and take them to different territories which happened previously here in walmapu for example under the framework of the ethno governance where the government generates or creates fractions in the communities itself or native peoples itself for example 
when you say we create a link with people that want to talk. So how do you know who doesn't want to talk? From which perspective do you talk with them? That's my question. If you let me, I can reply to you. In these complex spaces, for example, like in Recoleta, which has a lot of population, it has a lot of diversity and that has different needs. Of course, in here it's different to other spaces where maybe that fragmentation is more visible. In our case, we have to face and deal with communities that are already fragmented, like the ones that come from the south or the north, and they have come here out of need. So we are connected in a territorial aspect with different communities. So when that happens, our work has always been trying to reconnect with these indigenous peoples or communities, trying to create an, an space or a dynamic where we have respect and are respectful with each other. The topics that we talk or they deal with are not things that we can come up with. Those are things that the organizations or the communities come up with. For example, we want to do X thing and we try to help them, for example, when they propose some activities or projects. And in that sense, we have a huge diversity. Maybe there are people that do not agree with the local governance. There are people that are from the right wing, are religious, and that do not have the same perspective. So there you have a different type of wiggliness to participate or talk. But in the end, we cannot oblige anyone to participate. So here we have like a social, like a legal void because there is no law that says you have to recognize the people, the indigenous people or communities, and that leaves it up to the municipality if they want to recognize them and work with them or not. We have the Segnam uh, community and native people that are trying to reclaim their recognition as an indigenous people. And also we have the Af African descendants that also are fighting to be recognized. So like them, there are others that are not recognized and it becomes complex when we don't have that like empathy of dialogue because it becomes harder to try to solve uh, situations that maybe can fall into a fragmentation like what you said, but this fragmentation from the government has different levels. So just to finish, maybe in the example of the housing, maybe it's not only with native people, when you get this grant, sometimes they are changed from the area or territory that they were supposed to be and that, of course, we can it makes it become weaker, this link that you have because you move them around. I don't know if that answers your question. In our case, to, to be told, Dividing the committees sometimes is complex. I was saying about this example where we had a community that we had to divide into because there were 200 people. And just because of things regarding to land availability, we had to split them. And that was the option variant that we had as a solution. 
it's really hard to fragmentate them or divide them, but we are trying actively to try to look for solutions for these families that are in need. So we had to divide them and split them into the ones that were more in need and the ones, the other ones, and it wasn't easy, but we had to give solutions. The policies allow us to divide the committees in other cases too. The thing is looking for quick solutions in the housing ministry that's like the main objective like to try to give as much answers as we can anything else that you want to say any other person that wants to say something before we close this I understand your positions and your opinions uh, regarding these frameworks that you work with, um, the policies that you can work with in these cases. But I would like us to think about the possible solutions maybe in this new constitution that we are writing, maybe this can allow us to think in the indigenous people's autodetermination, in our power as nations. Yeah, yo soy terapeuta ocupacional y, y pensar también en, en las planificaciones yeah. públicas estatales desde, desde and maybe we can think about this bottom up because if we make public policies that are just like a short term solution for example just as simple as planif the plans of a square, it doesn't, is that is not something that comes from the need of the people or, or the culture of, of the people. The people have this, they themselves have these configurations of being Mapuche, in Santiago or in different regions are different. These public policies just are short-term solutions, but they are not developed and nor thought in a long-term aspect to consider what's best for the indigenous people. So that's what I wanted to highlight, like the importance of thinking from a bottom up perspective, thinking about them and, and what's beneficial for them. And also we should question why there are, there is no land. Like who is the owner of those lands that makes us not have land? Sí, también pensaba mucho en lo que decía la ñaña. I was always, I was also thinking about what Caterina said. Regarding the criteria of responsibility related to the impacts of these policies. I understand there is an effort and it's hard to work from the states to create these bridges to be able to operate and carry out these projects. But I'm also wondering what's the responsibility of regarding the impacts to who has the responsibility of recognizing or not some indigenous people in a certain territory or also the responsibility 
regarding some decisions of splitting some community just in order to be able to access some projects. Some projects require to meet some criteria where bad practices starts coming up. This has an impact in people's life. The Mapuche communities are very vulnerable in the economic aspect. So that's what I was like wondering, like how we can think about the responsibilities that are within the public institution because you can create some programs to help, but at the same time, you're also creating new problems. That's my comment. In what measure can you see that the customer law can have a space versus the state law in this framework? So in some, in Chile, these customary law, it, it's not approached because we are very rigid. We are in a discussions from um, urbanist scope, but do you think that uh, there is a way of this culture practices can be part of the of our law i wanted to say that maybe this is related to what viviana and caterina were saying there is a political context that we cannot ignore we have a post social crisis that we are going through. We have a new constitution going on where 10 different indigenous peoples, community and native people were recognized. So that work is important to take into consideration. From Recoleta, my municipality, where we were always supporting these constitutional, new constitutional process and the work that we do with the indigenous people have always been from have always come from a place where we want to work together with them some of these indigenous individuals are the ones that help this new constitutional writers the ones that are going to write the constitution from the Segnam people, native people that are working with the Kawaska people are trying to work together to create a recognition. So I think that this customary right is the one that allows Segnam people to say, we are alive, even if the government doesn't recognize us. At least in Recoleta Mai municipality, we recognize them and they have a voice and they have power of vote. This Friday, we have a resistance, Segnam resistance uh, recognition event, just as an example. So that customary right, that is not formalized. I think that it depends a lot on the practice space that we can develop. I'm talking about the practice of the, the use of the rights. So 
these native people through organizations are presenting their needs. We know that maybe we don't have the tools and nor the jurisdiction, but who puts the limits regarding this responsibility? Are the, the people, the native people, if this person did this, this and that, he cannot participate because he went beyond the limits of our culture. So if that person, person did this and the indigenous people said, no, he cannot participate because he did this, that's what we respect. So those are spaces where we can think about the customary aspects so we can develop it, develop it in a more visible way. That I think that is what happens in, there are some communities that are in the North fighting against the mining companies and not with the government support or municipality support. And in the South, there are a lot, a lot of hydroelectric projects and in a customary way, they defend themselves. So we can, in a institutional way, I think that this new constitution is very relevant and we need to keep fighting. The right wing never left. They are, they just reorganize themselves so they can keep going. So we have to keep fighting and that's what I think from my side. Miss Nancy, do you want to add anything? Truth to be told is that this has to do with the housing programs are all come from like high level institutions of the government. We have to try to relay these kind of opinions so we can change this type of situation. The housing programs have been modified and they will be keep being modified. And as a region, as long as we start giving and presenting the opinions to the higher levels, then we can start making changes. But if we do not speak about this, if we don't let them know the demand, then it becomes impossible to, to give a solution to this, in particular in these housing projects. We have let know the higher level institution the opinions, but there had not been spaces where we can meet directly. If we know about this, about the opinions, about how they feel, then we can let the higher level institution know so we can change the project. But this comes from concrete information. Thank you so much. So just to be finishing, I think it's interesting to go to different and extreme areas and from different native people. This all linked to the urbanist aspect. There is one thing that we have been talking is that there is no reposition of these 
a space, native spaces. When you recover these spaces, you only have dividing ways of recovering. From the many years that I have, I have familia Mapuche, de, de entender también la experiencia del despojo y el desplazamiento en definitiva. O sea, es muy distinto vivirlo desde Santiago, probablemente lo que se vive desde el sur. Eh, know that it's different what you live in Santiago than what you live in the south. What we see here tentáculos como de política pública surgen más bien desde las organizaciones de las comunidades. arms of these problems, you can see that it comes from a bottom up, like there are the people that reach the institution and the people that fight for a space in the land. So I think that this is not only related to the wiggliness of the government and the state. And with this, we can see little achievements. But this is not something that the government has done, it's something that the communities have achieved. Like Nancy said, there are, there are a lot of fights to live and survive since we don't have land, since we have a lack of land. So, however, what is interesting is to read again all of this with one mate. We were discussing this difference between the Aymara native people and the Mapuche people and the differences that they had with these Mapuche people, we also have different aspects since they come from different places and they have different needs. Imposible, eso no se puede. Sin embargo, la organización hoy día está haciendo, hay cuantos guías, tú no dirías Santiago, masivo, eh, ya han ido recuperando espacios. Entonces, eh, through the years, these native people have recovered lands and rights. Here, we have contradictions of a state that has many colonizing influences and that lives with this rigid colonizing aspects. I want to thank all of your presentations and your wiggliness to come debate about this. Thank you for everyone that was present here and the ones that are seeing the broadcasting transmission. Nunca facilita la mayoritaria votación política a cierto sector. <laughs> Esto está muy a la luz del... So, we have many questions regarding the future that we are going to face, especially considering the process that we are going through right now. The majority of the Mapuche communities are in Santiago. And Santiago is also part of Walmapu, I mean, the Mapuche territory. So we have to try to review who are the owners of the lands. So I would like you and to invite, I would like to invite you to watch the previous presentations that we had so we can see what we were talking there because it's related to this. Well, thank you so much. We say bye right now.
we invite you to at five see the presentation of Lily who also talks about these issues and she will speak about the new colonial city. I don't know if Matthew is there, maybe he's not, so I can say the name right of her presentation. I don't know if you can tell me, well, it seems like he's not here. Well, I will take now. Yes. Yeah, it's es, that one. Es la propiedad, eh, is the bueno, no lo tengo abierto, propiedad y la precariedad del habitat en la, la ciudad de la colonial, neocolonial. Well, in the neocolonial city. She will take us to Australia to see that this is also happening in other places because maybe we think this only happens in Latin America. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, all of you. Have a good afternoon.